today we are going to do something that's a little bit different. Many of us, when we hear the term railways in, term, in the context of World War I, think of things like railway guns or temporary railroads on the battlefield. And those, we, we tend to think in terms of the tactical level or maybe the operational level of war. But there's an old saying, which in some version probably goes back to the Romans, that the amateur thinks of strategy and tactics and the professional thinks of logistics. And when we read that they fired a million shells right before the Battle of the Somme, how many people think, wow, how in the world did they get a million shells up to the guns? Well, they did it by railways for the most part. And we are now going to have a presentation by Mark Jelovich on just exactly how they did that. What did they do to transport the huge numbers of men and the even more massive numbers of logistics and supplies up to the battlefield in World War I? Uh, you all know Mark from his time as a volunteer. So Mark, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, that was a good introduction to what I'm going to be talking about. Um, my understanding is a couple of years ago, uh, a presentation was made about the, the, the uh, narrow gauged lines or felt bottom that went up to the, actually went to the front. We won't be discussing that so much as, as the standard gauge, the regular railways, and how they played a role moving uh, people and material uh, from port uh, to the battle, uh, to the um, uh, to the front line. Uh, so as a preface, we're going to focus on railways on the Western Front, including German, French, and British rail systems. Uh, also, uh, the extent to which the U.S. was involved in operating railways, especially in France during the war after 1917. Uh, there'll be somewhat less focus on the Eastern and Balkan fronts, uh, but we'll cover those briefly uh, towards the end of the presentation. Um, on the Allied Western Front, each division, which would average out to about 12,000 soldiers apiece, had an average need of about 1,000 tons of supplies each day. And that meant about two supply trains of 50 cars each going to the front to supply each division. Um, roads in France uh, in the second decade of, of the 20th century were inadequate for heavy truck usage. And the canal system, the way it was laid out, just didn't, wasn't very helpful for moving military goods to the front lines. Um, so uh, initially, the British tried using trucks extensively at first, but found that things like mud, poor roads, and so forth made this transport mode very inadequate. And thus, there was a need uh, for to use the standard gauge uh, rail system, uh, standard gauge being four feet, eight and a half inches, to haul personnel and material uh, to someplace near the front lines and then often narrow gauge uh, rail to the trench lines, uh, most of the narrow gauge railways being uh, a uh, two foot span. Um, in France, uh, standard gauge trains went to what are called regulating stations. Basically they were warehouses and these were usually about 20 miles from the front line. And then narrow gauge trains haul the material uh, from the warehouses to the front. Uh, the French had many regulating stations along the front line uh, for two principal reasons. One was to be closer to troops being supplied. The more stations you have, uh, more regulating stations you have, more warehouses you have, the easier it is to get them, the faster it is to get them to any particular unit on the front. But also the Germans managed to break through uh, to a regulating station and capturing such, it wouldn't be a, a major loss in terms of material uh, that was needed for the French war effort. Uh, Stepping back a minute, uh, much before 1914, the European powers realized there was a military need for an effective rail network. Uh, some historians argue that uh, if you, uh, that the first major war in the world, then Val Railway was the American Civil War in the 1860s, uh, 
Uh, but if you look at Europe, at the European situation, uh, probably the first major European uh, war uh, that used railways extensively was the Austro-Prussian War of 1866. And there's some interesting diplomatic uh, side notes to that. Uh, the principal battle uh, of the Austro-Prussian War was at Königsgrätz, what's now uh, the Czech Republic. Uh, the Germans had four supply lines running to Königsgrätz, the Austrians only one. And uh, before the battle actually started, the Austrians had approached Bavaria, which at that time was still an independent country, asked the Bavarians if they could, uh, the Austrians could use Bavarian rail lines to move into Bohemia, uh, what's now the Czech Republic. Uh, Berlin uh, told uh, Munich that would not be a very bad idea, and the Bavarians backed off that. Uh, but you could argue that a major reason the, the, the Russians won the war was because they had better access to rail in terms of supplying their troops. Uh, shortly thereafter in 1861, 1871 rather, railways played a crucial role in the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, at the turn of the century, Britain found that in uh, pursuing the Boer War in Southern Africa, uh, the rails were needed to move supplies and people into the, uh, into the heart of South Africa, the Transvaal region. Um, more generally, the Germans were concerned about the possibility of a two front war of France and Germany. France, France and Russia, I should say. And so between 1870 and 1914, the European rail network tripled in size. Um, so in Germany, the rail network went from about 3,600 miles in 1860 to about 36,000 miles by 1914. And the Germans had developed uh, 13 independent east-west routes and four north, independent north-south routes uh, with the intention of being able to move, uh, among other things, military people and equipment uh, from one border to the next, uh, going in both north, south, as well east, west directions. Uh, there were 15 rail crossings of the Rhine River, where the Rhine River was a natural barrier against the French, the West in general. In the case of Russia, Russia uh, moved from a very small system of 1,400 miles in 1860 to 44,000 miles in 1914. That did include the Trans-Siberian Railway, which is about 8,000 miles, uh, but nevertheless, the Russians had a, a major uh, rail building network going on, rail building effort going on at the end of the uh, uh, 19th century. But as we'll discuss later, it also was a very poor system. Um, beyond that, Germany had envisioned a Berlin to Bagdad rail, rail line that was never built, never completed, but was seen as a potential threat to British influence and control of the Middle East. And uh, beyond building uh, routes, uh, Germany and France began to double track certain main lines to handle potential military movements. Uh, with proper signaling and uh, sightings, a single track could only handle about 40 trains a day with uh, a double track system, again, with adequate sightings and signaling up to 60 trains a day. Um, get back to the slide, the map in a second. Uh, the German rail system covered, again, about 36,000 miles of standard gauge. Uh, the German rail system in 1914 consisted of a number of state-owned, if you will, provincial-owned rail systems, the largest being the Royal, the Royal Prussian Hessian Railway System, about 24,000 miles, the Royal Bavarian State Railways, about 5,000 miles, and the Royal Saxon Railways, about 1,700 miles. But if you look at a map of the German network, um, basically the Upper two thirds of Germany was run by the Prussians. Uh, Bavarians had the most of the southern part of Germany, and then the Saxon railway system basically was uh, uh, along the south of Czech border with Germany. Uh, That's around Dresden and Leipzig. Okay. Um, um, but during the second, although you had a different provincial systems controlling the railway system in Germany. Uh, during World War I, uh, the military had effective control over the railways in Germany across all the provinces, across all the states. Uh, the Germans also domestically located large troop camps near major rail depots so that soldiers and material could get be uh, embarked on the trains very rapidly. And in 1914 altogether, the Germans had about 30,000 locomotives, 65,000 passenger cars, and most importantly, probably about uh, 690,000 freight cars uh, that they could use. Um, 
Parenthetically, in 1920, after the war ended, uh, the provincial rail system merged into one system, the Deutsche Reichsbahn. Okay. Uh, and to give you an idea of what German locomotives looked like, the bottom two locomotives were sort of standard uh, freight locomotives that the, the, Rus the Prussians in particular used uh, during uh, that time frame. Okay. Um, so by 1914, the French had about 16 rail lines to the German border. By the same year, the Germans had 13 rail lines to the French border. Um, those were many more than were needed to handle normal peacetime passenger and freight movements. Uh, but the French rail system was not as efficient as the German one. Uh, first of all, most of the French lines radiated out of Paris, which created a potential bottleneck in the system. Uh, secondly, the French rail companies, we'll discuss those in a second, did not standardize a lot of the equipment. That is, different companies had different braking systems and signaling systems and so forth. Uh, and the typical protocol in, under French, uh, in the French networks is that locomotives and crews were confined to their own particular rail district. So if you cross a district line, even in the same rail company, uh, you had to change engines and crews that tend to slow down movements of trains. And because of that, and the, because of the way the French rail system was managed during the war, you had some tension arise between the military and the civilian managers, uh, the latter more interested, more interested in particular in, in moving civilian passengers and civilian freight, not just military uh, personnel and cargo. So if you look at, at the French rail network in the 1880s, well, after the 1880s, where the French rail network was consisted of six regional rail companies, basically regional rail, rail monopolies. In particular, two of those, the Compagnie du Nord and the Compagnie de l'Est, uh, served the combat region in France. And um, if you look at a map of the Compagnie du Nord, basically it was everything from the Belgian border south to about Paris. Um, another system was the uh, Company du, du Midi that wasn't very important in terms of the war effort, except that discuss in a second, uh, the, the Mediterranean ports became important uh, places uh, to disembark, among other things, American troops and, and uh, supplies. Um, the Atlantic ports that were serving ships from the US were so, uh, served primarily by the Company du Midi and the Company d'Etat. The Company d'Etat is interesting because it was the one of the one of the five, the only one of the six rail companies in France that was uh, publicly owned. The other were private enterprises. And another one of those was the PLM, the Paris Lyon Marseille rail line that served Mediterranean ports uh, and gave access uh, into central and northern France. Again, parenthetically, those six companies were merged into the uh, into what's now SNCF, the French National Railway System, in 1938. We turn to Britain. Uh, Britain in 1914 uh, had about 23,000 rail track miles and about 4,000 stations. In 1911, the United Kingdom was divided into six areas of military command, each with a designated principal railway. And in 1912, the following year, a railway executive committee was created uh, to coordinate uh, British rail, railways in wartime. Uh, the British rail system was considered to be one of the world's best, if not the best rail system. In particular, it was very easy to move trains between companies, territories. You could run through, through freight trains, through passenger trains with very low difficulty uh, from the north to the south of England or east to west. Um, and that helped a lot in terms of moving uh, unlike in France and moving people and personnel within Britain, particularly towards the British ports. And then in opening the REC, the railway took over uh, uh, management of the railways uh, when the war broke out. Well, anyway, uh, the British rail, the REC took over managing rail companies in August of 1914. Uh, in terms of employment, the largest British rail companies, the London Northwestern Railway, that had about 70,000 employees, followed by the Great Western Railway, about 70,000, by the Midland Railway, Northeastern Railway, Lancaster and Yorkshire Railway, the Great Eastern and Great Central Railways. There are also a number of many smaller railway companies, uh, all that were privately owned, uh, including the large ones. Um, after the Sec First World War, though, they were merged into four major railways, 
And then in 1947, after the Second World War, they were nationalized into one system, namely the British Rail. Um, and to give you an idea of what a British locomotive looked like, uh, uh, this was actually a passenger locomotive that was served on the Southeast and Chatham Railway. Um, um, uh, particularly in, this, in the southern part of Britain. Mm -hmm. In terms of British ports that were served by rail, uh, there were four major ports along the uh, English Channel that were uh, embarkation points for uh, to carry uh, people and personnel, uh, pers personnel and product and cargo across the English Channel uh, to French ports. Uh, there was Southampton, and during the course of the war, about 2.7 million tons were shipped out of Southampton, and also Southampton handled about 7.2 million people, uh, both military and civilian going both ways. That's both entering and leaving Great Britain. Uh, New Haven uh, was another port that handled mostly munitions and stores. Uh, the, uh, they during the four years of the war, they handled about 6 million tons of total freight. Uh, Dover and Folkestone handled mostly troops and ammunition trains, handling about 7 million people during the war. Uh, Richborough was actually a port pretty much created for the war for so-called roll-on, roll-off operations between Dunkirk and Calais. Uh, roll-on, roll-off is where freight cars are loaded onto barges at the one end and then rolled off on the other end, in this case in France. Uh, Rick, uh, Rick Burrow handled about a million tons of freight uh, during the war, uh, but really no passengers. And then other major ports that the British used in the war effort were Hull, Grimsby, and Immington. Hull in particular was on the Atlantic, uh, pardon me, on the North Sea uh, side uh, of the British coast. And uh, this is kind of a picture of, in this case, of uh, on the French side of things, unloading a uh, British rail car for use in, in um, actually a British ambulance car for use on, uh, in France. Um, within Britain itself, uh, you had obviously freight movements going on. What, what was interesting was the use of was, was coal for the Royal Navy. Uh, the Royal Navy used primarily Walsh high grade steam coal, uh, but as U boats began to threaten. Uh, uh, ports, British ports on the south. Uh, the Navy, the Royal Navy moved ships from southern to Scottish ports, uh, which meant that a lot of the coal had to be moved northward. Uh, but the bottleneck arose because many Scottish rail lines were single track and double tracked uh, compared to the rest of Britain. Also, towards the end of the war in Britain, some short distance freight movements began to be shifted from rail to truck. Uh, but almost all freight shipped to France went by rail through British ports. Um, and what's interesting is to look at actually was carried between Britain and France. Uh, you might recall from both within the museum itself, as well as from uh, uh, other pictures from the war, uh, that horses were used a lot in the war effort to, uh, say, move cannons and, and other equipment along the front. Uh, interestingly, about that, about five and a half million tons of tonnage hauled between the, U the United Kingdom and France consists of oats and hay, again, for the, the war animals, uh, the mules and the, and the um, horses. Ammunition came in second, about 5.3 million tons, coal about 4 million tons, food about 3.2 million tons, ordnance stores and clothing about 1.7 million, engineering stores 1.4, railway material about um, a million tons, timber about 800,000 uh, tons, Roadstone, that's to say gravel, about 700 million tons, or total tonnage was about a little over 25 and a half, about 25 and a half million tons. Again, almost all of that carried by rail to British ports and then shipped uh, on to France. Um, another aspect to the British war effort was the, was with the employment of women in British railways. Uh, prior to 1914, there were about 13,000 women employed by British rail companies and were considered to be female occupations. That is waitressing in, in uh, uh, station restaurants, cleaning uh, cars and stations, things like that. Uh, but as uh, more men initially volunteered for war service and later on were drafted into war service, 
uh, the railway companies had to uh, hire and promote more women into um, um, uh, into rail occupations. This created though some problems between some tensions between the British Railway Union and uh, uh, the British government. And so in 1915, August of 1915, uh, the agreement was reached with the National Union of Railwaymen, the umbrella uh, railway organization and railway organization in Britain, that stated that men could return to their jobs when the war was ended. Also that women would pay minimum wages uh, in terms of the scale for any one, one particular occupation within uh, the railway industry. And so railway female employment rather was considered to be a temporary phenomenon uh, to address the war effort. Uh, that being said, women began to take over began to take over male occupations, things like ticketing, uh, maintenance, acting as porters, and other fields. But at the end of the war, uh, almost all women were uh, laid off, let go, uh, as more men, men returned back to railway service. Um, and it's not a very good picture, but some pictures illustrating, some photographs illustrating what women were doing for the railways included, say maintenance, uh, uh, things like lamps and signals, uh, maintenance of locomotives, uh, as well as other activities uh, such as ticketing that had traditionally been uh, held by men. Um, Looking at the French ports and railways, uh, ports unloading US soldiers and equipment were mostly along the Bay of Biscay, that's the Atlantic Ocean, including Bordeaux, Poliac, Maloche, Montoir, Brest, and some other places. Later on, Cherbourg on the English Channel and set on the Mediterranean Sea at where the uh, Paris Lingon Marseille train ended, um, became more ports. Uh, the Americans found that several ports needed upgrading in terms of track mileage. Track, rail trackage, rather, warehousing and wharfage. Um, one problem in terms of scheduling uh, trains, uh, scheduling uh, ships arrival and trains departures was that uh, uh, was evading U-boats, uh, which messed up otherwise fixed shipping schedules. And this created some on and off congestion uh, during the war. That is sometimes there were too few trains available to meet incoming ships at other times. The opposite was true. And on average, it was about 500 miles from port to Western Front. Uh, that is between uh, uh, when cargo and people were uh, disembarked from the ships and put on trains uh, heading either north or eastward. Uh, but the most important rail lines for US forces came out of Brest, Bordeaux, and Set. Brest and Bordeaux being on the Atlantic side, Set on the Mediterranean. Uh, so you had Brest and Bordeaux along, along here, uh, and uh, Set was down here on the Mediterranean Sea. Um, rail equipment is also an issue. Uh, rail equipment is sometimes referred to as rolling stock in the railway industry. Uh, but French boxcars were two axled and were dubbed 40 and 8. That is, they could carry 40 soldiers or eight horses which meant in terms of freight, they only can carry between 10 and 12 tons of the maximum. Um, and um, they were had to be loaded and unloaded almost entirely by hand. Uh, forklifts didn't really exist back then. Uh, the French box cars did not have food or toilet facilities in these cars that, that required frequent stoppages uh, uh, to meet those human needs, but also uh, they had to, the local motors had to stop uh, about every hundred miles or so uh, for, for, for new coal and new water. Um, the war effort increased French rail traffic by 40%, but by 1970, between depreciation of equipment, wear and tear of equipment and war destruction, there were 5% fewer French engines available and 9% fewer French rail cars available for the war effort. Um, and so the U.S. began to step in uh, after 1917 to assist in this in the rail effort. Uh, U.S. rail traffic in France was supervised by civil rail executives uh, under the command of U.S. General. These executives came from uh, principally three railways, the New York Central and the Pennsylvania, where railway companies that competed with each other uh, in the New York, Chicago, St. Louis market. 
Uh, the Lehigh Valley was a coal carrier in Pennsylvania, um, relatively well, a very small company uh, by mileage concerns, but uh, became a prominent player in the war effort. Um, because of French rail losses, uh, the U.S. had to start supplying the French with um, locomotives, and among others, uh, these were so-called, and probably the most common locomotive sent over was so-called consolidation-type locomotive. Um, uh, consolidation locomotive uh, is on the bottom picture. It's sometimes referred to as a, uh, uh, a 280 locomotive that as you had uh, uh, two wheels. Uh, uh, you had two wheels on the um, the pilot uh, on the pilot truck, uh, four driving wheels, but no uh, uh, but no trailing uh, uh, no trailing um, <coughs> wheels. They're also called Pershing locomotives, uh, uh, for obvious reason that uh, in reference to the commanding general of the Americans back then. Um, of the 960 locomotives, 200 were used by French rail companies. The balance are used by Americans to haul American uh, people and equipment around. The consolidation was a popular engine in the United States, but was larger than most French steam locomotives. Uh, that being said, the, the consolidation could, so could still handle comparatively tight French curves. Uh, initially, they were shipped to France as kits for assembly, but later, as ship hulls were reconfigured, uh, whole engines were sent over. Uh, Americans typically ran longer trains than the French did, uh, which in turn meant the Americans had to, in some cases, build longer sidings uh, along the French rail lines. Um, they also required coal, obviously, but French coal was of poorer quality than mined in the US. And so the US typically used a combination of French as well as English coal in firing their locomotives. Um, the Americans also uh, began to use, if you will, Americans type box cars, uh, four axle freight cars that could handle up to 33 tons. Uh, these were shipped as kits to France for assembly. Interestingly, though, the U.S. hospital trains were using used passenger cars that were built in Great Britain. Uh, that is that we didn't ship uh, those types of uh, carriages over from the United States. And uh, an example of, of a a uh, U.S. Uh, ambulance train uh, using British equipment would be uh, in the two photos here. In terms of rail freight movements uh, between 1960 and 1980, you need about 30 trains a day uh, to go to the French front, where each train, each division needed uh, one train load every second day at least. Uh, freight trains, sometimes referred to as divisional supply chains, usually had 40 cars. Again, mostly unloaded by hand. And weekly rail shipments uh, averaged about 195,000 tons of, of, of freight uh, to the front, on average about 34,000 tons of general stores and supplies, about 15,000 tons of stone uh, for roads, about um, 12,000 tons of railway supplies, principally coal, about 18,000 tons of ammunition, which were carried ob for obvious reasons separate for trains. And during times of major operations along the front, those tonnages would obviously increase. In terms of moving people uh, from uh, port to front, uh, the British trains would carry about 1,200 soldiers. Uh, they used the French uh, 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 40 and 8 uh, cars. Um, in this case, you put 40 soldiers per two axle box car. This is very stressful, obviously, on the British troops, especially, and um, particularly with all the delays involved in terms of, uh, say, uh, meal and toilet breaks. Uh, the British had railway transportation officers who tried to coordinate movements with the French and to move uh, British soldiers and material to the front line. But with stops and so forth, uh, slowing things down, speeds only average about 15 to 25 miles per hour. Uh, by comparison, the U.S. troops were carried in trains of 54 axle cars with 56 soldiers each. Uh, these uh, cars equipped with toilets, among other things, much better accommodations for the soldiers. And U.S. military trains were, were 
military trains were primarily uh, run by US crews, not by French crews. Um, by 1918, uh, there were problems arising though uh, in moving uh, soldiers, US soldiers among other, so that uh, in December, we had about 50,000 soldiers landing in France. Uh, by July of 1918, that went, went up to 300,000 soldiers, which created a serious strain on the rail system in terms of moving people. And by October of 1918, only about half the needed supplies were getting to the front, but that became a mood issue when the war ended in the following month, in November of 1918. <clears throat> Turning to the German war effort, um, uh, German armies entered Belgium, German arm armies entering Belgium found much of the rail system destroyed by retreating allied troops. Only about 15% of the rail network was actually usable by the time the Germans occupied Belgium. Uh, this created a, a severe logistical issue for the, for the Germans uh, as the nearest railheads were about 50 miles behind German lines, in some cases, as far as, far as away as 80 miles from, from the German lines, and this slowed down the German advance. Um, because of the, of the uh, damage done, uh, destruction done by retreating allied troops, uh, the Germans had to do extensive rebuilding of bridges, often using wooden structures in place of steel structures, oftentimes using, uh, say, putting in a temporary uh, one-track bridge as opposed to having beforehand a permanent two-track bridge. Um, along the way, not just uh, bridges, but also signaling systems were destroyed. Uh, and the French did the same as they uh, retreated from French territory. And, and as the Germans moved in, they found the same sort of destruction going on with the uh, French rail network. Somewhat ironically, uh, during the Belgium occupation, uh, French and Belgian POWs were put to work on reconstructing the rail network in those German occupied areas. And uh, there are any number of photographs you can have of, of damage to the railways in, in Belgium. Uh, one is of a, a, well, of a train that uh, uh, was blown off its tracks. Another one of the bridge, a bridge collapsed, uh, well, dynamited uh, as part of, as the Belgian French uh, soldiers retreated. And that's just kind of a straight picture of a German locomotive. <laughs> um, in occupied Belgium, the German policy was try to integrate the Belgian rail network as much as possible into the German network. Uh, gradually, some civilian passenger rail traffickers were restored in Belgium, uh, but uh, there were a couple of problems that the Germans encountered. First of all, there was a lack of personnel that were knowledgeable about French and British, about Belgium and French rail networks. In the case of France, it had been the Nord and, and Lest uh, rail companies in France. There are also some language issues, particularly in Belgium. Uh, as you know, Belgium is a trilingual country. Uh, depending what part of the country you live in, uh, you either speak uh, Dutch or German or French. And that meant that many uh, cities had three names. A uh, good example is Liège, which is the second largest city in Belgium, third largest city in Belgium right now. Uh, the French name is Liège. Uh, the German name is Lutich. Uh, the Dutch name is, is Lauk. And so there was some confusion arose uh, uh, by the occupying Germans in terms of uh, confusing cities because of different names for the same place. Uh, the Germans kept passenger tickets prices high to discourage travel, civilian travel. Most free traffic in Belgium was geared to supplying Belgian products, principally coal, uh, to Germany. And there was limited freight service to neutral, the neutral Netherlands from uh, both Germany and occupied Belgium. And among other things, obviously transit traffic between France and the Netherlands ceased because of the war. Um, as in Britain, uh, German women uh, became involved in working on the railways and particularly after uh, the inauguration of the Hindenburg program in 1916, which was among other things, tried to get more civilians involved in the war effort women began to replace men in railway jobs, including physically demanding positions. Uh, German railways had lost about 300,000 men to the military during the war. Uh, for example, the Prussian State Railway, the largest system in Germany, lost about 40% of its male labor force uh, 
to conscription and replaced in terms of 90,000 women. Uh, but Hindenburg plan, the Hindenburg plan and other things uh, required many women, uh, including uh, uh, mothers whose husbands were say at the front or otherwise not at home to go to work. Uh, this created all sorts of problems in terms of raising children and finding food uh, after work, say trying to run down groceries towards the end of the war. Um, uh, and uh, unlike Britain, again, uh, German women were oftentimes involved in more physically demanding positions, uh, particularly say in, in rail maintenance, uh, other types of occupations that required a fair amount of physical strength. Uh, if you turn to the Eastern Front, um, in Eastern Europe, you had a number of different problems going on. One was that there was no standardized track gauge. Uh, you had different gauges in different countries, but in particular, the Russians used what's called broad gauge, about four feet, 12 inches. Uh, and this created problems for in moving goods by rail from standard to broad gauge. Um, as the Russian armies retreated, as uh, they destroyed railway bridges and stations and so forth along the way, uh, this slowed down Germany's ability to supply German troops by rail uh, one way the Germans tried to solve this was, was to regage some lines as they gained territory, that is, uh, move the rails about three inches closer to each other. Uh, similarly, as the Russians uh, managed to gain some territory back, uh, they did the same to uh, go back to broad gauge. But either way, it created, it slowed things down in terms of being able to move uh, people and material on the Eastern Front. Um, the Russian rail system itself had about 44,000 miles of track by 1914, carrying about 132 million tons of freight that year. But by 1917, that had dropped dramatically um, down to about uh, 37 million tons. Uh, the Russian rail system was distinguished by the fact it had virtually no signaling system. Instead, only one train could operate between two adjacent stations. Um, rather primitive way of running a system. Uh, by some estimates, they were short about 90,000 freight cars uh, needed to supply the Russian army on its eastern front. Uh, the coal that was mined in Russia was of low quality uh, compared to coal available, say, in Germany or Britain or the United States. And partly to solve the problem, uh, the Americans began to uh, offer the Russians uh, U.S. locomotives and rolling stock. That came to halt after the Bolshevik Revolution in November of 1917, and U.S.-built equipment scheduled for Russia was diverted to France instead, um, or in some cases kept within in the United States. If you're ever in, in uh, parenthetically, if you're ever in St. Louis and drop by the National Museum of Transportation in uh, this pair, they pair rather uh, southwestern uh, St. Louis County. They have on display uh, what they call the Bolshevik lo locomotive. Uh, this was a locomotive built in the United States to be shipped to Russia, but uh, after the October Revolution, it was kept in the States. Uh, the, uh, the wheels were adjusted to uh, standard gauge and the locomotive itself was sold to the Frisco railway system, uh, the St. Louis San Francisco railway system uh, for use in the United States. Um, Austria-Hungary, uh, in, 19, in 1867, after the Ausgleich, uh, which basically gave the, the Magyars, the Hungarians, uh, domestic control over about half of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, the Austrian rail system was divided into two parts. Uh, the Hungarian rail system with the MAV, and the Austrian system, the Kaiserliche und Königliche Staatsbahnen uh, network. Uh, at the beginning of the war, the Hungarians had about 4,300 locomotives. Uh, the column caught about 7,600 locomotives. Uh, and that meant that during the war effort, the Austrian system basically supplied the Italian front, the Hungarian, the Eastern front. Um, in 1915, as Austria-Hungary faced defeat by the Russians, uh, German troops uh, were moved by rail through Silesia, what's now, what was then uh, Eastern Germany, now Poland, to the front to bolster the Austrian army. Um, and interestingly, um, again, with an American twist to it, um, some of the captured Serbian rail equipment ended up in Austrian and German hands, including US-made locomotives. Uh, 
An example of such or what are called mallet locomotives uh, in the United States, they were used uh, extensively in the Appalachians and the uh, uh, Rocky Mountain West uh, to haul uh, heavy freight trains, particularly coal trains. Uh, 10 of these were sold to the Serbian government before the war. Uh, during the war, they were captured by the Austrians and divvied up between themselves and the Hungarians. Uh, finally, we can look at the Balkan campaigns. Um, the Balkan rail network, uh, the Southeastern Europe rail network was much less dense than uh, in Central or Western Europe. You had uh, uh, sort of a, a main line that ran from Belgrade uh, uh, through Nish uh, into, into Bulgaria, Sofia, eventually ending up at Constantinople, now Istanbul. You had uh, some branch lines running off into Northern Greece, uh, uh, some lines running into uh, Romania. But by and large, the system was much less dense than you found in say France or Germany or Britain or for the matter, Austria or other parts of the uh, Austrian empire. Um, and um, probably notable in the Balkan campaigns for the railways was uh, what happened in the so-called Salonika campaign. Salonika is the second largest city in Greece. It's uh, the major port in Northern Greece. Um, and uh, the Salonika campaign saw British, French, and Serbian troops fighting Bulgarian troops, Bulgaria obviously on the Axis side, from the Central Power side. Uh, because of human activity, supplies shipped by rail through France and Italy, and uh, supplies were shipped by rail through France and Italy to Adriatic ports, and then uh, by ship to Greece, uh, including the port of Salonika then by rail from Salonika and uh, up to the front and by truck to the front lines. Uh, interesting, the Salonika campaign ended when French and Serbian troops managed to shut down the major rail line serving the Bulgarian army and basically uh, made it impossible for the Bulgarians to, uh, uh, to supply uh, their troops. And this is a picture of a Bulgarian supply train going up the Vardar Valley. Um, uh, in well, 1917. Uh, so what can you conclude? <clears throat> well, obviously railways played an important logistical part in World War I on all sides, both sides. Uh, probably more interestingly, uh, the war highlighted the use of bimodal shipments that a ship and rail, uh, shipments uh, following both ship and rail transit and multimodal ship, rail and truck transit along supply chains. Uh, you could argue that indirectly World War I sped up the nationalization of rail networks in Germany, France, and the United Kingdom. It highlighted the need for uniform braking, uh, signaling other systems and protocols between rail systems in any one country, especially France. There's still a problem in, in Europe today, even with the European Union, in that uh, between individual countries, uh, rail systems, there are different signaling systems. In the case of electrical uh, power generation, uh, different AC and some systems are AC, some systems are DC, which means you have to either switch locomotives at the border or have to um, have the locomotives adjusted so they can e operate on either AC or DC power. And also, uh, last but not least, you could argue the war show the role of women expanding and running railways, at least temporarily. Um, and that's it. Very good. Mark, thank you. There's a huge amount of material there. You know, I just finished a book called No Man's Land by uh, a guy named John Toland that yeah, talks yeah. about the last year of the war. And one of the features of the last year was the during the German offensives in the spring, mm -hmm. the British put great store on protecting the channel ports. Yeah, uh, Dunkirk and uh, those areas. And it's clear from, from this lecture exactly why they were so anxious to do that. Yeah, the yeah. French, on the other hand, wanted to protect Paris. And the net yeah, result yeah. was almost a split between the uh, British and the French, through which the Germans could easily have, have uh, wreaked havoc. It didn't yeah, happen, yeah. Uh, but it was one of the contributing factors behind appointing folk 
as a generalissimo to coordinate all three, uh, the well, all four armies, the Belgian, British, French, and American armies, yeah. just to prevent that kind of thing. But it's easily it's easy to see why Field Marshal Haig was so protective of the uh, northeast of France and the Channel ports. Yeah. Are there yeah. any other questions? Just press your um, press your uh, space key if you want to unmute yourself. What happened to, uh, did we leave all that equipment in France after the end of the war? Um, yeah, um, I'm not sure what happened to it, how much was repatriated to the United States, how much stayed in France. I suspect um, because the, local, the, the consolidation locomotives were pretty big for the French systems, they would have, would have used them much after the war. Uh, but I, I don't know what the disposition was uh, in terms of what they've brought back to the United States or whether they were sold off to somebody else. It may have been just thrown in with the rest of the war debt. Uh, yeah. You know, the the France and Germ France and England were sending gold to the United States to pay off their debts for the next twenty years. Yeah, mm -hmm. literally up until the next war. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, again, uh, one reason for the collapse of the gold standard was that um, what kept the gold standard afloat in the 19th century was the um, uh, the British were net exporters and had a huge gold supply and could therefore, you know, anybody who had, who had pounds sterling could get gold in, in the Bank of England very easily um, because the trade surplus is paid for in gold. Um, but uh, the war cut off the British ability to have trade surpluses and, and pretty much wrecked their gold supply by 1918. All right. Well, thank you very much for your contributions and for your talking about this. It's a fascinating area. And I think uh, actually you've, you've only scratched the surface in many ways. There's a lot more no. uh, material here.